Can you sit down? Now, children, you've been very patient. I maybe could have sent you out earlier. But if you want to go uh, now to classes, then children are welcome to go to Sunday school. Matthias is going with you today. Okay, we're going to read again from God's Word, and this time in the New Testament and the book of Acts. Um, If you have uh, a church Bible, this is Acts chapter 6, and it's on page 1098 in the church Bibles, and in the Farsi Bibles, it's page 1423. We've come to the end of our little series on our church life and membership and discipline and leadership and we've come to the subject today really of serving within the church and again how that's led and how that's done and uh, this is a great passage for rooting our thinking in you could have gone to a number of places in the new testament but this i think is a, a very helpful model from the life of the early church in the book of acts for how we should go about those things so it's acts chapter six and we're going to read the first seven verses. Acts chapter 6 verse 1. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose men, sorry, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, wouldn't you love to see that happen here? That is, that last verse which we read, the word of God spreading, the message about the Lord Jesus Christ becoming widely known in our community, The number of Christians in the area increasing and rapidly even. Scores of people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Conversions to the Lord Jesus even amongst the spiritually hardest people, which would have been the priests uh, that I mentioned here at the end of the verse. They would have been the the hardest people because they were the... uh, Religious professionals, those are always the hardest people to become Christians. Now, that's a wonderful thing that they saw then, isn't it? And, and praise God, that exact same wonderful thing is happening today in many parts of the world where the gospel is having a powerful influence and many, many people are becoming Christians in uh, their communities. And that you could look for any number of places in the world where that is happening today. So still New Testament Christianity in this way is still uh, uh, very much alive and God is doing that work. And we don't see it in quite the same way here in the terms of numbers and the uh, apparent power uh, that uh, the uh, gospel has in its, its direct impact. But who knows, maybe soon God will do that here too and we'll see those days again in this country. But what I want you particularly to see from this verse, verse 7, where we read about this wonderful gospel progress, is the word it begins with. So if you look at verse 7, you'll see that it says, so. 
the word of God spread. Now, what is that telling you? It's telling you that this wonderful gospel progress and many people becoming Christians was actually the result of something else which has just happened. This, 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 this happens. So the word of God spread and many people became Christians. You see the kind of logic of the passage. So you have to look back into verses 1 to 6 to see why verse 7 happened and to see how it happened. And what you find back in verses 1 to 6 might surprise you a little bit when you think about it because verses 1 to 6 don't describe uh, a kind of great push for evangelism. You think, well, obviously what must have happened is they set up like a, a kind of a mission and they, they sent out people with preaching and the gospel and there were tracts and there was everything to kind of help people understand the gospel and of course then people, lots of them became Christians. Well, that isn't what happened in verses 1 to 6, is it? It's not a, a preaching mission or an evangelistic effort that leads to this gospel increase. Rather, verses 1 to 6 describe how this particular local church sorted out a very practical need among themselves. We've just read it, so I hope you can remember what that practical need is. We'll come to it in just a moment. But crucially also, these verses describe how those who were responsible for preaching and teaching in the church were getting sidetracked from that into another area of service, which was vital service, but which wasn't preaching and teaching. And they needed to sort that out so that they could give attention again properly to the word of God, and that's why the gospel spread. So verse 2 says that the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. And they have to sort out that problem, which we'll explain as we go along. What I'm saying is this. The reason the gospel grew in power at that particular time was because the believers in that church came to understand this. Everyone in the church needs to be served well and treated fairly in practical matters. But that cannot be allowed to consume so much time and effort of the elders in the church that the elders' public proclamation of the gospel starts to suffer. The word of God, the message about Jesus has to stay absolutely bright and clear and central from a church's leaders. Otherwise, we will never get to see the joy of verse 7, the word of God spreading and lots of people becoming Christians. There needs to be that central clarity from a church's leaders that this is what the gospel is, equipping the people of God to be witnesses where they are and publicly proclaiming the good news about Jesus. Without that, you will never see gospel growth. But the problem was is that the elders were being sucked into other stuff which was distracting them from concentrating on that. And they needed to sort that out first so that the gospel could kind of flourish again in their proclamation. So if we want to see verse 7 happening here, the word of God spreading and people becoming Christians, one thing at least that we need to do is to come at this question we've been asking of who's who in church life. We need to come at that question from one final angle. And it's the question of not so much who's who, but who does what? Okay, Who does what in a local church? What should the elders be doing most? What other things, apart from eldership jobs, does this church still need to do well? And who should be doing those things, or who should be leading those things? So that's where we're going um, this morning, really answering those sort of three questions. What should elders be doing most? What other things should a church be doing, apart from eldership things? And who should be leading those things? So let me put that in three kind of propositions for you. First one, elders mustn't do everything. Yeah, that's the first thing you need to see. Elders mustn't do everything. 
So verse 1 tells us, interestingly enough, that gospel growth and people becoming Christians was not just the end result of this little passage in Acts, but it was actually the source of the problem at the start as well. You see that? Verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing. Okay, so you've got gospel growth being the, the root kind of cause of the problem as well as being the, the end which came out at the, at the other end. In other words, at the beginning of this, more new Christians in the church meant more stretched resources. There were just more people around to care for and to look after and to disciple. And the leaders of the church in particular then became stretched too thin. They weren't getting to every practical need in the church. They wanted to. They were concerned for people. They wanted to make sure everyone was provided for. But they ended up, because of the sheer numbers, the growth in numbers in the church, that they, they neglected some people. And there may have been some fault on their part. Some favoritism is perhaps implied on their part. But at the, at the, at the end of the day, the result was the same. And tensions were rising. So verse 1, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Not everyone was getting the same sort of practical care as everyone else. And it was creating tensions between two different ethnic groups in this case. And that's a problem. Because Satan loves to break up churches however he can. He doesn't care how he does it. He just wants to get churches to divide and split and fall out. He wants to divide and destroy the church. If he can do it with persecution, great. He's happy with that. If he can do it with false teaching, fine. He'll do it with that. But normally... This is where we need to be particularly alert. Normally, Satan doesn't uh, divide and destroy churches through persecution or false teaching. He can. He normally does it just by Christians falling out. Right? Just by people not having good relationships. And they just personally don't get on. And they, and they can't sort it out. And churches end up spitting because of that. Yeah, doctrinal differences... <laughs> Sometimes he goes for that, but not normally. He seems to prefer simple, practical issues instead. That's where we've got to be most wary. It's not going to be that we all suddenly kind of, oh, I've got this great theological debate, but rather just, just we're not getting on very well. And Satan loves to exploit that. I've got a friend who's a pastor in another church in a different part of the United Kingdom, and he was telling me just the other day, massive strain on the unity of their whole church uh, but just because of this because someone from one family in the church uh, some time ago did some building work for someone in another family in the church and for some reason something didn't work out or someone didn't get paid in time or something and the two families have totally fallen out about it and now other people are getting kind of drawn into that dispute over some DIY, you know, over some building. And the thing is, my, my friend's saying, well, they still agree on what the gospel is, these two families, right? They still agree about who Jesus is. They still want to follow Jesus. It's not that one family's gone, we're denying the faith now because you messed up our bathroom or whatever it was, okay? They still love the Lord Jesus, both sides, but they I cannot get on because of something practical that they just are loggerheads about. And the whole church is under huge strain because of it. The devil loves that. That's what he wants. The devil will want to just... He doesn't need you to kind of say, well, we're going to deny the doctrine of the cross. or just, just fall out over something stupid. That's what he'd love to see. <coughs> Be alert, the Apostle Peter says. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, I'd say, seeking churches to devour, seeking people to devour. We've got to be on the lookout for his designs. The elders in the church here, or the apostles who kind of functioned as elders in Jerusalem, they realized that 
this needs to be sorted out. But if they become so consumed with sorting out the detail of this particularly practical matter, they are then likely to neglect what they are supposed to be concentrating on. So, verse 2 again, the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. They're not demeaning the idea of waiting on tables and serving people practically. It's because they were doing so much of that that the problem is arising. But they say, now we're neglecting our number one ministry, the ministry of the word, so we can't carry on like this. If we do neglect it, Satan will win twice. He'll win in getting people divided and he'll win in subduing the gospel. The proclamation of the word won't be so clear because the elders will neglect it. And so we're here we have this vital New Testament principle. Elders mustn't do everything. There are all kinds of things, obviously, in church life that absolutely need to be done. From youth work to building to finance to serving in all kinds of areas, of course. But both elders and those who aren't elders need to remember that the elders do need to concentrate the vast majority of their time and energy that, that, they, that they have on what? We're told. Prayer and the ministry of the word. Verse 3 ends with these words. We will turn this responsibility over to these other people and we will give, verse 4, our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, that idea of praying and word ministry, that's not just about um, public prayer or public word ministry. It's about any context where an elder brings the influence of God's word into the lives of other people. The lives of Christians and members of the church to the lives of non-Christians, the people that we're evangelizing. Doing it publicly, yes, like this or in other public contexts, but also doing it privately, giving their time to spending time with others in, in person, in their homes or or perhaps on the street, or in other ways. But it's all about prayer and the ministry of the word. What does that mean in practice? It means that if at all possible, there will be exceptions to this, but if at all possible, the elders of a church shouldn't be getting too involved in things like managing the finances of the church, or maintaining a building, or running the sound system, or running the music, or as in this case, coordinating organized efforts to help church members who are less well off. Now, that's not to say that they have no concern about any of those things. They have very much of a concern about those things. But this passage is saying they're not to have the same kind of direct involvement all the time with that and to be so absorbed in that that they get sidetracked away from their main ministry, which is prayer and word ministry. Every single elder should still absolutely be a people person. We've seen that before, last time. And they should be willing to do absolutely anything for those people, not denying that. But the point is they just mustn't be doing everything. They mustn't be spreading themselves so thinly as that. They have to concentrate the majority of the people ministry that they're called to on praying for people and bringing God's word to people. Now, that is basically a full-time job. I mean, some elders are full-time like me, and some, like Andrew, aren't paid to do the job. Or they are, they're working, and they've got a part-time kind of eldership ministry. But in, in one sense, not about the hours you put in, but just the, the role that you have. And the responsibility should be one where you're looking at that. I'm, I'm always praying for the church. I'm always seeking to bring the word to bear on the lives of other people. And that's a particular ministry that elders are called to focus on in the study, searching God's word, preparing to preach and to teach, and with people wherever they are found. So, practical application then, if you see me or Andrew right, straying into other areas too much and taking up all our time doing other stuff, even though good stuff, Maybe because of pride on our part, maybe because we think, well, we can do this really better than anyone, or maybe because of some kind of micromanagement to make sure everything's just so, or, or some other reason, maybe good reason. If you see us doing that, it's okay for you to step in. It's okay for you to say, oh, brothers, just get back to what you should be doing. Prayer in the ministry of the word. Or even if you're able to say, 
Can I do that? Or can I find someone else to do that for you? I'm not shirking, okay, work. But I'm trying to recognize the balance of responsibilities that this passage and others in the New Testament lay out for elders. And all of this is not because those other things don't matter, it's because they do matter, and they need to be done as well. They need to be done well, uh, but not always by elders. So elders mustn't do everything. Okay, That's the first principle. Second principle, churches need more than word ministry. Churches need more than word ministry. So we're seeing, I hope, the word ministry is vital. We all need to hear God's word regularly applied to our lives. And that's what the elders are called to do and to concentrate on. It needs to be at the center of church life. But what's interesting in Acts chapter 6 is that the apostles don't say, well, this church has got great word ministry, you know. We're apostles. We're great at preaching. We're good at the word ministry stuff. So that's all we'll ever need. As long as we've got the word ministry, we don't even worry about anything else. We just rely on the word and that's it. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we don't need to worry about the bread because we've got the word. No, the, the apostles don't say that, do they? They don't say it's, it's, all, it's only about word ministry. No, they say, let's get the bread sorted too. <laughs> yes, man shall not live by bread alone, but they still need bread. And we still need to care for the practical needs in the church. It mustn't be our job, elders' job, they say, specifically. But that doesn't mean it should be no one's job. It does need to be figured out somehow. The church family still needs to be cared for in these very practical ways. Just as much as in direct word ministry ways. And so, what's their plan? Verse 3. If it's not right for them to neglect the word of God ministry. Verse 3 says, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So, don't think that as long as we've got half-decent preaching, we're doing church right. Absolutely not. If we are doctrinally sound, but we have people who are simply not being cared for properly in their practical needs, then we're not really a New Testament church at all. We're not like the church in Acts, at least. Jesus died and rose for us as a group so that we might become a family. That is the part of the work of Christ. He's created that. So if we're neglecting the family of God then we're denying the power of Christ's work. Just as much as if I were up here denying the resurrection. Listen to what James says. If one of you says to a brother or sister, go in peace, be warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? James chapter 2. So, there must be practical ministry as well as word ministry. So there must be the ministry of people with cars giving lifts to people who don't have cars. There must be the ministry of Christians who open their homes to other Christians. There must be the ministry of phone calls and visits to care homes and people who live on their own. There must be the ministry of cooking meals for ragged parents of young children. There must be the ministry of inviting widows or single people, members of the church, into family contexts where they can be part of that kind of family. There must be the ministry of doing DIY for members who who don't know one end of a hammer from the other. There must be the ministry of babysitting or dog sitting or tool lending or advice giving or hug providing. The list of ministries in a local church that are not explicitly word ministries, is almost endless. I've just given you just a scattering there. But there's just all kinds of things which also need to be done, which are absolutely essential to the, to the lifeblood of a church. And so what's really interesting is that in Acts chapter 6, both word stuff and practical stuff, they're both called ministry. 
It's not immediately clear in English. But in verse 1, uh, we're told that there was this complaint about the, uh, against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked literally in the daily ministry of food. In the da- daily serving, service of food. Okay, so that was a ministry that wasn't happening and needed to happen. But in verse 4, it says, we'll give our attention, the elders, to prayer and the ministry of the word. That's the same word. So the word used for serving food is the same word as the word used for serving the word. Two different kinds of food, if you like. But both vital, both ministry. Gets on my nose when I hear people say, how long have you been in the ministry? There's no such thing as the ministry. It's Pastors are not doing the ministry in a church. We're not the only ones who are doing ministry. The whole church serves one another. That's all that means. Ministering means serving. I'm serving you with a word. Yeah, but we all serve each other in all kinds of other ways as well. It all counts as ministry, whether you're serving up the word or serving up the food or serving up something else practical. Now, don't get me wrong. Of course, all the ministries of a church, all the service that goes on, is to be shaped by the word. Right? That's why the apostle said we need to keep this central, feeding people with the word, so that the service you do in all kinds of ways during the week and on Sundays is, is shaped by the message and gospel of Christ. That needs to be stimulated by and shaped by a vision of Jesus that comes from spirit-filled preaching and teaching of scripture. That is central. That's so important. But... All these things shaped by the word must still be seen as just as necessary as the word, as word ministry, if a church is going to be a gospel church. So, I don't know if you think this is controversial, but biblical teaching in a church is not enough. There needs to be biblical living as well. Biblical community. Biblical serving. Okay, you, you can't do without any of those things. I'm not saying let's give up on the word, but we mustn't be giving up on those other things as well. So just ask yourself, if, if you're a member of this church especially, where are you serving? What is your contribution to others and to those who might need it in, uh, in this church? What job do you do? Do you say, oh, well, I just come? No, well, how do you serve? What are you involved in? What are you helping with? What's your ministry? I, I remember when I was a teenager, I was part of a youth group in a church I grew up in, and there was a guy there who was one of the leaders, he, a beloved guy, I, a model for me as a, as a young teenager. Um, I looked up to him. His name was Alan, and I still, uh, he's, he's still there in the, the church where I grew up, and he's still one of the most humble and gracious men I ever met, and just a a, a wonderful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, he 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 was he had some quirky questions and things sometimes to make you think. And whenever he met somebody new to the church, he always used to give them this uh, this question once he'd known them for a bit. He'd say, "In a church of five hundred members, how many ministers do you think there should be?" He'd say, and the person would go, "Well, if there's five hundred members, how many ministers do you need probably?" And he'd say, "Shall I tell you the answer?" 500. 500. And, you know, he's not trying to catch anyone out, but I always, that always struck me. We think too much of the only ministry being word ministry, pastoral ministry, up the front ministry, but it's not true. That's not the only kind of ministry. Churches need more than word ministry. That's the point, okay? It's all rooted in that, but it needs more than that. So where are you being a minister? Where are you being a servant of the church, of others? What are you doing to to be helpful? What gospel-driven thing or things are you doing for the body of Christ to allow the elders to concentrate on prayer and the word, but also to ensure that other practical needs are met within the fellowship, within the building, within the stuff that we do, and to ensure that other members thrive rather than merely survive? So in a church of 65 members like this, How many ministers should there be? 65. Serving in one way or another. Now, if you're thinking, oh, hold on, this is new to me. I'm not sure. I knew I was supposed to be doing that. I need help. Great. Fine. 
Come and, come and talk to me. Talk to Andrew. Talk to a deacon. David or Julian, they say, what, what needs doing? How can I help? I want to serve, but I don't know how and, and, and what it's all about. I'm kind of new. Well, you can just ask. And if you need help knowing kind of how to do it, what does it look like? You can just watch as well. You can watch people who've been doing it for many years, like the deacons or like people who are serving in various ministries. And it's that kind of uh, model servant that we turn to finally now because we're thinking, uh, as, we, as we bring this all to kind of a conclusion, of what the, the Bible says about what we call deacons. So let's turn to them now. They're not named as deacons in Acts chapter 6, but I think that what they do is the role of deacons. And here's the point. Here's the principle. Third one. Spiritually mature people must lead those other ministries. Right? So we've seen that elders mustn't do everything. Churches need more than word ministry, but spiritually mature people who are not elders should lead those other ministries, okay? the non-word ministries. So we've seen everyone's called to serve somehow, but not everyone is called to lead the serving ministries in a church family. So um, we've already seen verse 3, but let's read it again. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And they get this responsibility. It's not everyone kind of does it and there's no organization. There's seven people who are chosen to be ministers of this particular task. The food ministry, if you like. And in verse 5, we, we're told who they are. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch. So these seven guys are, uh, are, are particularly kind of um, put forward for this role Verse 6, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them, so the word of God spread. Okay, so there's this appointment of particular people to lead this other kind of ministry in the church. But I want you to notice why they're chosen. You've got to do this kind of distribution to the poor. They're involved with food and, and giving people the food that they need. So why are they chosen? Is it because they'd all been waiters in previous jobs? Kind of good at that. You know what they're doing. They can, they can dish out food very well. Is it because of that? Or ma maybe they were all well up to date on their food safety training. And uh, no one was going to get sick because they did it well. Well, I have no doubt those things would be helpful okay, in doing this particular ministry. And they, these guys were a match up for that. But that's not what we're told. That's not what's most important. We're told that they needed to be people who were, quote, full of the spirit and wisdom. Verse 3. And we're told that Stephen particularly, who seems to be almost a leader among leaders of these guys, is a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. So it, as with elders, as we saw last time, again, it's not so much about gifts and skills, though they can be very helpful and important in certain contexts. It's much more like who are going to be the leaders? The people of character. The people who love the Lord Jesus Christ more than anything. The people who are wise and who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, why do they need to be that? Well, if they're going to be leading this ministry to people, they must be able to take responsibility, not shy away from some hard things, perhaps, and time and effort and expenditure. They need to be patient when things go wrong, as things do go wrong in this kind of ministry sometimes, and where you get people arguing about stuff or things, thinking it should be done in a different way. People who are leading it need to be patient and to be able to listen and to be sensible about that. They need to be kind to people who maybe are a bit difficult to serve. They must be wise in making some hard decisions sometimes. And they must have faith in God that they will find his help when they need it. And they must believe from the heart that his honor is more important than any other thing. His honor is more important than their comfort, their reputation, or anything to do with themselves. They must be selfless. The whole goal they need to see is not simply to get the job done. Great, that's all the food distributed. Excellent. No, it's to do it in a way that shows the love of Jesus. So they've got to be men of faith and the Holy Spirit, people of faith and the Holy Spirit. And that's the, the, the job description, the character description of what the New Testament calls elsewhere. Deacons. That word deacon is really just a, a transliteration of a Greek word that means servant. It's just servant with a capital S, if you like. 
these people are tasked with the same kind of serving as everyone else. They've not got a special job. They're just doing the same job as everyone else. But they're, that is, except the elders. They're not doing the same job as the elders. But they are to take the lead in doing those jobs. And they're to provide an example for everyone else who wants to serve alongside them. And that's why when you get the qualifications for deacons in 1 Timothy chapter 3, for example, you can go there and look. You find, once again, the most important thing about them is not their gifts, it's their character. And also, I will just say in passing, it is my position on this subject, and Andrew's too, that also the most important thing about them is not their gender. I do think that in the New Testament, you can have a man serving as a deacon or a woman serving as a deacon. And uh, if you come back this afternoon, we'll be discussing that maybe slightly more controversial subject as well as part of our discussion. So if you want to hear more about that, come back. I do think that women can be deacons because they're not required to teach and they're not required to have authority in leading the church as a whole in the way that elders are. So again, it's their character rather than their skills or their gender that matters most. That's where I stand on that. So if you think about who in this church might take up such a role of leading the serving in this area or that area. And, and we, we must actively be thinking that, not just thinking about who's going to be an elder, but who will be deacons too. We need to appoint new deacons, I think. Let's not just think, well, who's good at practical jobs, you know? Um, who has skills with food or with finance or with children or whatever other area we might want people to be serving in and leading in? No, we've got to think, who's like Jesus? Who will be gentle with sinners like Jesus? Who will forgive readily like Jesus? Who will hold on to the truth firmly like Jesus? Who will love God keenly like Jesus? Who will pray about their serving consistently like Jesus? Who will give up their time and money and energy for others without ever complaining like Jesus? Who will lay down their lives for the sheer joy of seeing other people saved and sanctified like Jesus? Okay, being a deacon is about being Christ-like. Just That's basically the job. Serving responsibly and lovingly in that way. All of that is just a picture of him, the Lord Jesus. And that's where we want to end this, this morning. Because no servant of Jesus, no deacon in a local church will ever do it perfectly. That's why we all serve with such deep gratitude, remembering the servant. The one who came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. There's never been any serving that ever got close to his, has there? It's the greatest servant of all. And that's why we need to look beyond ourselves to him and to, to worship him as we seek to serve in church and see who might be like him to help us lead in those ways. So let's uh, finish by singing together a song which reminds us of the servanthood of Jesus and ask God to help us to think in the same way ourselves. It's from heaven you came, helpless babe. So let's stand uh, to sing together. <laughs>